Stanford University. Hi everyone, my name is Ruxian Chen. Um, I work in I work in uh, Zynga. Um, today I'd like to talk about some of the uh, data access needs we're trying to solve um, to get analytics data available to our applications. Uh, we use a system uh, called Membase. I don't hear that mentioned in some of the talks, so I want to describe that a little bit today. And so um, we have a Vertica data warehouse. Um, uh, from these guys uh, from Vertica, and uh, most are tracking data from uh, game game web servers will reach the Vertica data warehouse, and we'll actually do um, some uh, computation to calculate uh, aggregates about user, and this, these aggregates will be fed into main bases in a form to be consumed by uh, by web uh, web server code. I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about Membase and how we're deploying it in our data centers, and then what's the content of data in here and how we access it, and then some operational uh, how we how we run it in operation and some of the challenge and next steps. Uh, so Membase is basically a key value store like Memcached. It's the same protocol. Uh, what's additional is uh, it offers persistence and uh, replication. Uh, it's developed by a company called Couchbase with contribution from Zynga. Uh, so uh, with replication, um, we use that a lot uh, for, uh, to support Zynga's uh, deployment. Uh, we deploy it um, uh, in one master cluster and several slave clusters. Uh, this uh, module I'm talking about, data, Zynga Data Services, one of the bigger deployment of main bases inside Zynga. Uh, writes only reach the, the master cluster, and replication takes care of propagating the writes to the slaves. So what kind of data do we have? We have about five billion items, and these, um, some part of our the aggregates I mentioned earlier, and some are the, uh, the data actually are not aggregates. The games can access that storage in a, uh, it's a writable to the game as well. They actually use that to communicate certain interesting data across different games, and we use that in a host of our services. Um, so the two types of data are here, daily aggregates, and then also information on each user. Um, for example, we want to detect a user made a purchase in one game, in another game, and that might trigger certain actions in this other game, so that's how we use this main base to communicate that. Um, we uh, have two types of access. It's a direct library, uh, plus uh, a subset of users, um, our games, uh, use REST to access that. Uh, it's used by um, most of the Zynga games, as well as a lot of services that Zynga use internally. Uh, we use that to um, filter and quantify users, and we also use that to compare users and sometimes matching users. Uh, so we have, um, uh, we have a lot of different use cases that we're going to try and integrate into our API. So operation-wise, uh, we use Zookeeper to, uh, to configure the cluster. And uh, MCMAX, which is a uh, connection pooling layer, um, on top of that to uh, manage connection caching. And we also use Moon and Nodules for alerting if the, the systems are not running fine. Uh, one of the things we need to watch out for, which is one of the part that Membase still needs to improve is the replication. Uh, we have different data centers. One, make sure the data are in sync, so we need to alert whether they're out of sync. And we have checks in, in, in that to monitor if replication's happening successfully. And one other thing, uh, like I mentioned, Membase offers uh, persistence. So we use that to, uh, to do backups. Not our data can be uh, pushed out uh, easily and quickly. So we want to be able to recover from local disk, which is a lot easier than if we have to um, ask either games or central services, in this case from Vertica, to publish the data again. And lastly, some of the next steps, like I said, replication is very important for us because we have different games in different data centers. 
and we, we want to improve the performance of replication. And some of the problems we're seeing if we have too many items being uh, changed uh, quickly and the queue will build up, uh, at this time uh, the replication might fail. And I also want to explore server-side clustering. It's a plus and minus and we want to make sure that works well and better performance. Thank you. Okay, uh, th this, is, this is my attempt to help Yasik out. So s benchmarks are a great idea. Uh, you know, you, you, it gives a level playing field and encourages vendors to do, uh, have features that make your benchmark go fast. And basically, you know, Yasik would like to see commercial systems do a lot better on LSST's workload. Uh, so this benchmark is an abstraction uh, of LSST, which is an astronomy workload. Basically, uh, captures the essence of a whole bunch of other fields in addition to astronomy. So I think it has, it's fairly general. Uh, Yasik's workload looks like this. Uh, telescope takes this. Uh, then what happens is that uh, you, you end up uh, doing a whole bunch of workflow downstream. So you want to capture the end-to-end -end processing from telescope to derived data products to queries. So basically, this benchmark is ingest a bunch of raw data, cook it into a bunch of derived data products. What that means is look for stars uh, in these images, uh, store the stars as observations and other kinds of celestial objects. And then uh, if you point this telescope in, to the same place in the sky at some subsequent time, you'll see the same observation again. Uh, couple those observations into trajectories. And then uh, the benchmark has queries on the raw data, queries on the observations, queries on the trajectories. And some of them get pretty hard. There's a lot of spatial queries. There's a lot of uh, basically raster-like processing. Uh, Jim Gray had a paper a whole bunch of years ago, which was 20 popular Sloan uh, Sky Survey queries. This was all on the Cook-derived data. So the big difference here is that this is the end-to-end -end problem as opposed to uh, just <coughs> queries to the Cook data. So I already said it, it's. It's a bunch of raw imagery. It's a terabyte uh, of raw imagery cooked into observations, as I just said. Uh, basically, this is a clustering algorithm, uh, and it gives you polygonal spatial data. It's further cooked into trajectories. Trajectories are cylinder-like things that move, move over time. Uh, and it's uh, store all of this stuff and run queries on it. So uh, in the, in the you know, essence of, of TPC, uh, the regular is a terabyte. It scales up and down uh, to get harder and easier. And there's a whole bunch of parameters, which is like how, how big a, an area of the sky do your queries look at. So you can make the parameters make this benchmark much easier or much harder. Uh, and so load some data, cook what you loaded, and then run a collection of queries uh, that are on raw data and cooked data. So that's basically the benchmark. The details of the queries are on the poster outside that you can go look at during the break. And uh, what we did was we've run this benchmark uh, we ran it on MySQL, uh, 10 nodes worth of MySQL with uh, Facebook style application level uh, sharding, uh, which was a huge pain in the butt. Uh, and on SciDB, SciDB does the sharding automatically. Uh, SciDB is about a factor of 15 faster than MySQL on this benchmark. Uh, it's faster for a variety of reasons uh, that, that are all uh, reasonably significant. Uh, the first one is the uh -oh. first one is you've got to have reasonable spatial database support. 
because uh, there's a lot of polygonal data. And MySQL, uh, MySQL spatial indexes aren't that good. Uh, part of the benchmark is load. And MySQL is not very good at loading. And that's one thing that users routinely complain about. Uh, the other thing is that there's a whole bunch of attribute data. And if you store it column-wise, it tends to be faster than if you store it row-wise. MySQL stores it row-wise. SciDB stores it column-wise. Uh, SciDB gets a lot better parallelism, because if you're taking an image and you, uh, you want to uh, pick out the observations, you want to have a chunking system. Thank you very much. I'm Maya Gokhle, and I'm going to tell you, the title says it all, Compute Capable SSD Architecture for Next Generation Volatile, Non-Volatile Memories. Um, Arup Day is the student who's been doing this work for his PhD under the direction of his advisors, Rajesh and Stephen, and uh, I'm his mentor at, at Lawrence Livermore. So. Uh, the, the crux of this work should be very uh, resonant to the audience here from what I've been seeing today, because what we want to do is bring the query uh, um, to the data in the penultimate form, so we're not actually moving it to the, the bits of storage on the flash or the PCM, but we're bringing it to the storage controller. And the work is really motivated by the observation that in future um, storage architectures, that with a DRAM latency of one, disk is out here at, at hundreds uh, of thousands in latency. However, PCM, all varieties of the new non-volatile memories that are emerging slowly, but emerging, certainly flashes here, offer much lower latency that's more memory-like. In this work, we are looking at uh, the, these non-volatile memories being connected to the I.O. controller rather than to the memory controller. And as such, there's an I.O. bottleneck. So what we'd like to do is to move the, uh, the queries, the, the computation, as close as we can to the data and, and within the storage controller. Uh, this is the architecture that we're prototyping. It's uh, built around the, the B3, which some of you may know is a four FPGA prototype with 64 gigabytes of DRAM. So we're emulating the, uh, the, the storage controller and the um, PCM or, or flash or whatever memory we would have. And I think the contribution of this architecture is a, a method for separating the memory controller, which is talking to the non-volatile memory from the storage processor, which is actually going to be doing the, the compute algorithms. Uh, in, in this particular incarnation, there's four FPGAs, and therefore you see four groups of uh, storage controller and memory controller in a ring uh, on the PCIe bus. To go a little bit deeper, the storage processor uh, has a request manager. It has a DMA engine to talk to the memory controller. And uh, in this example, this is a grep kernel. So an obvious application might be filtering, looking for certain patterns, such as DNA uh, substrings within the, the data blocks themselves. So uh, that's a representative kernel that would be run as a stream processor. So it would get the, the bytes off of the non-volatile memory, do the filtering, and then return results over the I.O. bus back to the, uh, to the server. Uh, so this is the, the architecture within the FPGA of the uh, storage controller. And, and what we've done is actually put the compute kernel in hardware. So the sorts of applications we're looking at are filtering, obviously, various sorts of filtering applications. Range queries might uh, work in that also, uh, where you're looking at scientific data and, and you want to uh, pull records that, that whose fields match certain range criteria. But we're also looking at, at less obvious applications, as, such as doing graph processing, graph traversals within the storage controller, uh, talking directly to the flash or PCM memories. OK, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nikolai Maliski. And today I present the proposal of Next Apex Data Storage. So the few words about the Apex, uh, this is a control system used in many accelerator uh, projects in the world. 
Uh, United States, for example, is just uh, used in the majority of the national labs in the Slack, Berkeley, Los Alamos, uh, Argonne, and uh, Oak Ridge. And uh, the next slide that presented an SLS2 built in the Borja National Laboratory. So in the short, uh, uh, Accelerator project is a, a big enterprise involving the many different uh, the system and also, um, also encompass of the uh, various uh, heterogeneous physical devices. So the a new project coming with the new ch uh, uh, challenges and uh, eventually we're coming up to the, uh, the new scale, like one million of streams of time series that, that we need to collect uh, in, the, uh, in the database and archiver. So for the post-processing, the analyzing, troubleshooting, and also the for commissioning of the operation. Uh, rephrasing uh, the statement of the previous, of the yesterday, so uh, the certainly relational database is a scale. Uh, but don't scale very well, okay? So we really need uh, a new technologies to solve this problem. So Apex likes, uh, likes challenges and uh, so looking also around uh, for the new application. Uh, this one is an example of a beamline data acquisition system that coming together uh, with the accelerator projects. So again, so, uh, new projects coming with the uh, new um, uh, technologies and uh, you can see like detected data rate of the for the new facilities on the scale of the uh, 50 gigabyte per second. It's a really enormous um, rate. So this data, of course, is a, a process of online uh, in runtime environment and, and also in the with the uh, usually a tomog tomographic uh, uh, application is just coming with the 3D imaging that we need to the store in the, in the file system. So we're working with the scientists and uh, we have some progress, it's a hard. Uh, so eventually we're coming with a, a common uh, data uh, format uh, it, that going to use uh, for the different experiment. So, uh, but again, so this is a very similar problem that uh, Ralph presented uh, yesterday, so that we need some common servers uh, to work with the uh, multiple files. In addition to that, uh, this files also correlated with the uh, control data because uh, experiment is quite difficult and uh, certainly the settings is really important and they correlated with the scientific data. So again, so we need uh, some common solution. So that um, after the analysis of several technologies, eventually uh, that I found it and pleased to found that uh, this is a very natural solution you know, suggested by the uh, CIDB, uh, the team. Uh, they call uh, re-oriented the conceptual model. So uh, the frankly, are looking for the same uh, approach for the several years. From my perspective, it's a really natural step in the evolution of column-oriented uh, databases. So in addition to the uh, natural representation of the previous use cases, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, CIDB uh, project coming with a, a very efficient interface integrated the very important the features like column oriented approach, chunk based approach, and many others. So that uh, after the sourcing, after analyzing the source code and the several different benchmarking and the prototyping, the our system eventually uh, came with the, uh, some proposal of integrated system. Okay, so that um, it presented uh, the two weeks ago at the uh, Apex collaboration meeting in the Switzerland, and uh, uh, very uh, good accepted. In short, um, using that again, so the Miguel term in the in situ database uh, approach, uh, we expect to use the CIDB as a common platform to connect all different subsystems in our environment. Actually, so to bind together the past, present, and future. So from the different perspective, it's also very interesting. So because uh, we can see the side DBs, it will be another service. Okay, the first of all is especially important for the beam line experiment. It provides additional service that doesn't conflict with the existing toolkits uh, that using the side DB, uh, using the for the HDR5. But in also, um, you, you know that it's also related to the uh, today discussion. So these are really the hybrid solution, the hybrid uh, environment, combining to the uh, databases and the file system. So we expect so we need to uh, really run that uh, quite complex data mining procedure as well, in addition to CIDB using the uh, different technologies. Thank you. I'm Siva from EMC Greenplum. Uh, so this whole extremely large data thing is getting uh, quite popular, uh, I believe. And so what, what's happening is, if you have a large amount of data and it's getting popular, a lot of people want to ask questions. Uh, that leads to a problem for a database management system. Uh, so, yeah, this is a problem when you get really popular. And you want to manage this. A database man uh, management system has to, well, manage this problem. 
So what is the problem? There is finite number of finite amount of resources in uh, in a database management system, which is CPU, memory, I/O, network, and maybe some others. There, and there's a lot of concurrent activity. Like I said, many people want to gain insights into this large amount of data, and they they all want to ask this, ask these questions now. And uh, management system must be able to support this. The problem is, not all questions are equal. <coughs> Some of them are more important than others, and this depends on time of the day, time of the month, uh, whatever. So this, for example, these could be loads, these could be weekly reports that you ask, and these could be more explor exploratory uh, analytic queries, which take a really long time, and this is something that you've never asked before. And each of these, like I said, could have different business value at different point in time. Now, the impact on a system may be orthogonal to the business value. It could be a really simple query from a, a technical perspective, but it's really, really critical for, from a business perspective and vice versa. So the problem here is how can a database administrator keep everybody happy? How, how does he align resource usage with the business value of queries? So the solution that, that we came up with uh, in the Greenplum Parallel Database is uh, is, is, is fairly straightforward, which is upon arrival, we determine what is the business value of the query. And that typically involves more than looking at just the SQL text. It involves a whole bunch of contextual information. But once you do that, we translate that to what is the fair share for this query, uh, what is the fair share that it, it should get of CPU and memory and other resources. And once this is determined, we try to reserve these resources in, in a certain sense. And if, that is, uh, if these resources are available, then the query can proceed uh, towards execution. And the second, second part of this is, once you've determined the fair share, you need to ensure that the query behaves. It behaves for the, the allocation. And that's the runtime resource allocation part. and uh, adjust behavior as necessary. So given this, uh, there is a slight difference between CPU and memory, as many of you might have noticed. Uh, CPU is like, like a bottle of Coke. Uh, let's say you have eight party guests who have, who have come over and you have, you have poured out eight glasses and a ninth one arrives. Uh, you can redistribute it without too much trouble. Uh, memory is like a pre-sliced uh, pizza. Uh, if you get a ninth guest, it, gets a little awkward trying to, uh, and this analogy is making me hungry. <laughs> okay, so CPU sharing. Uh, how we handle CPU sharing is, let's assume that we've uh, calculated the fair share uh, through some means, through, I mean, that's a well-researched topic. Uh, but what happens during execution is, every, uh, so uh, a query gets translated to a query plan, which is like a tree of operators, each of which does something special, and each query operator continuously measures itself. It sees how much of CPU it's been using. And it compares that against what is its fair share. And if it uses too much, it just sleeps a little. It gives it up. So that way, it dials down its, its, its usage. And rinse and repeat. This, this process occurs at extremely high frequency, so we're able to meet any target uh, for CPU usage. And I.O. and network bandwidths are very similar to this uh, in nature, because you can give it up by just not doing anything. Memory, on the other hand, is, uh, like I said, a little trickier, because once you give it up, it's very difficult to reclaim it back. So we took a slightly different approach, in, which case, in, in this case, every uh, query operator in this, in this plan gets a portion of the memory that we reserved for the entire query. And this is de determined using a memory distribution algorithm. Oops. OK. And data is too large. They spill. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Hey. Hi. I'm uh, Robert Reed, WAM Cloud. Here to talk about Lustre. Um, never felt so much like the ugly duckling before. Uh, so uh, let's get going. So Lustre is a file system, of course. It's GPL. 
a community, uh, there's a large community behind it now that didn't used to be. And it's still the industry leading uh, HPC file system. HPC, yes. <coughs> uh, it's got some good hero numbers. Actually, I have a nice picture of the Oak Ridge cluster. We'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, good scaling. It works well in both the LAN and WAN environment. It's a general purpose file system uh, that works at, at high scale. So this is the uh, Oak Ridge cluster. Uh, Scott was talking about this, a bit of this later. This is a piece of it anyway. This is just Jaguar and, and the other bits. So Jaguar is a big petaflop, big flop uh, supercomputer. Spider here, this is the Lustre file system. It's, you know, a few, like six petabytes or so. And it's being used not just by one compute resource, but all of these other resources as well. So it's a shared resource. There's multiple applications running on here and different things happening over there, which explains also why they don't really see the hero number all the time, because it's being chopped up into a bunch of different pieces. So we're, uh, you know, it's a POSIX -orient basic file system. Uh, it's coherent, supports data, metadata caching, has a DLM to support the caching. Um, but the interesting thing about Lustre is that although there's a metadata server uh, to support the POSIX namespace, the data is stored on distributed objects. And there's some interesting things that could be done there. The downside of Lustre is POSIX is basically a 70s I.O. model. The big uh, innovation on top of tape that you get with a file is random access. And we'd really rather you didn't do random access because it really slows things down. Uh, the concurrency isn't great, uh, and it just doesn't, and concurrency is a problem. It's not so big a deal. I mean, the, the single disk, when your concurrency model is based around a spindle, then the POSIX file system, you know, it's been working all right for us so far. But when you get an SSD that really demands a much higher amount of concurrency on a per disk, or per device, rather, uh, level, POSIX isn't going to do it for us. In addition to that, and uh, this was mentioned uh, earlier, that the POSIX namespace works well at human scale. It doesn't work well when you're creating billions of objects. And using the name as metadata is the wrong thing to do. So we need a better interface in between the parallel storage and the parallel applications. So what we're proposing to do uh, with Lustre is to create distributed application object storage, or DAOs for short. And this uh, is just drawn to play. <laughs> Uh, it is object, uh, so, so like I said, Lustre is object uh, storage underneath. So this is creating a system call interface essentially to this distributed object storage. So probably we'd see middleware being using, sitting, using this to uh, manage schemas for in individual applications. Uh, and the way this works within Lustre is you still have a namespace uh, that's used for legacy applications. And your, the DAOs applications uh, would or DAOs containers, which would be the, a run or an application's data, would sit in that namespace and look as if it was a bundle. So uh, POSIX uh, tools like LS or whatever would show just that container of data and not the billions of objects inside. And when the application ran, uh, it would access the objects all in parallel uh, through a different interface than POSIX. Uh, and another thing, since it's based upon uh, you know, a production file system, the tools, the administrative tools, the and integration with HSM and other archives would be, come with this system because it's part of the same storage architecture that, that Lustre is based on. So it's a new I.O. stack, a parallel storage, the DIOS API on top of that, and then uh, new middleware or mo middleware to use, modify to use the DIOS API on, on top of that. Um, you know, supports tens of billions of objects. In theory, it's going to be completely parallel. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Christopher Mitchell. I'm from Los Alamos National Laboratory. And just want to take a couple minutes to go over um, some of the work we're doing for visualization and analysis at scale. So coming from the high performance computing realm, we are starting to get inundated with large data. Um, as was said earlier, HPC users are trying to simulate the world um, and the products we use within it. And so it's, if you take a cross section of what we run on our clusters, you'll typically see stuff along the lines of uh, climate simulations, high energy physics, defense problems, etc. And it's not unheard of for these simulations to be detailed enough to produce terabytes, if not petabytes of data uh, for every run. And what we find is that obviously raw data is useless unless you analyze or visualize it. So what we've turned to is a tool called Paraview. It's a scalable open source platform uh, that's tailored to the high performance computing environment. And it works um, using data parallelism. So it's, that lines up nicely with the large volumes of data we're getting. Um, 
Also as a byproduct of that, we get data streaming so we can incrementally process through what's requested and we can do multi-resolution work where we can scroll through um, results immediately, but we get a summary view and then the fuller resolution uh, pictures uh, come in over time. So just putting an example up on the screen real quick, this is one of our plasma simulations. Uh, this is looking at magnetic reconnection in particular. Um, for this particular run, one vector field worth of data for one time step totals out to 6.9 gigabytes of data. Now in a typical simulation run, it's not unheard of to have hundreds to thousands of time steps running, multiple vector fields being saved, and a couple of scalar fields for good measure. And so as you can see, the amount of data that we're saving out from one simulation run adds up very quickly. So what we've had to do is initiate a project to rethink how we do IO and Paraview to handle this problem. Um, so as has been talked about, our current situation is we use a parallel file system to access the data over a storage area network. Um, this is becoming more and more expensive to bring the data to the processor and then the side effect of that is that the user applications uh, no longer are interactive. And so what we've done is we've said, okay, well let's take the Paraview IO system, let's rewrite it so that it uses the Hadoop distributed file system instead of a parallel file system and we're gonna go ahead and process the data in situ to where the data lies. Now the trick to this is Paraview is not a MapReduce application, it's an MPI program. So what we had to do is devise a scheduling algorithm that would place these MPI processes on the data nodes that actually were storing the chunks we needed to access. And ultimately, we want the goal of no network transfers. And so when we actually implemented this, what we found is we got uh, approximately a 3x three, uh, improvement in read time compared to existing solutions. And so what used to take about a second and a half to load per time step, now started coming in at about half a second to load. Now we can start playing around with interactivity again. And as another nice byproduct of this, we started getting a um, more consistent standard deviation on the results, uh, meaning that we're getting consistent read times instead of large fluctuations in how long it would take to bring in data. The graph you see on the side um, shows the results plotted out when it was run on 128 nodes of one of our test clusters. The light blue line all the way on the left hand side from your perspective shows the read time coming off of Luster. And then we see that the read times on average progress downwards uh, when we migrate over to using HDFS, followed by uh, the two different revisions of our IO system that encompass the scheduling algorithm within it. So, um, this is basically where we stand right now. If anyone wants to play around with Paraview, it's available at paraview.org. And within the very near future, we'll be pushing this HDFS plugin out to open source if possible. So thank you. Jane Mandelbaum from the Library of Congress. I'm gonna talk about some practical solutions that we're currently doing in the area of digital preservation, preservation of the data, whether it's in a database, whether it's not in a database, we don't really care. Okay, so um, the library has sponsored a major digital preservation initiative called the National Digital Information Infrastructure and Preservation Program, and we have a website, um, digitalpreservation.gov, that's got a lot of useful information on it. We're also starting a new initiative called the National Digital Stewardship Archive, I'm sorry, Alliance, and that initiative, we're encouraging uh, members from any kind of organization, commercial, non-commercial um, orga organizations to join us. All we ask is that you have a commitment to the preservation of content and that you join some of our working groups. So if you're interested, go to the website or come see me afterwards. So we may not have um, big data all the time, um, but we have biggish ideas. Uh, we know that it's really important to involve everybody in digital preservation. It's not just about one organization, so it's a distributed collection, and it requires a distributed infrastructure. And one of the other things that we're doing that we try to change the mindset of some of the people in our community is not to treat metadata records as records, but to treat them as data. So for example, you know, traditionally the Library of Congress, uh, you know, we think about catalog cards, and we're trying to make people instead think about linked data. This is a uh, visualization actually of the Library of Congress subject headings um, that we worked on actually with some computer scientists here at Stanford and that's showing all the subject headings as sort of linked data. So what we're doing now is we have a um, new platform that we're working on with some of our uh, partners called Recollection, which is for generating customizing views. It's a kind of visualization. Um, 
And it's not as cool um, as some of the other uh, pretty spectacular visualizations we've seen here, but it serves a sort of a different purpose. So what it does is takes your typical sort of, uh, this is a, uh, XML, uh, metadata records. Um, here's your uh, spreadsheet of uh, some more metadata records. And it turns it into something that looks like this. So as I said, this is um, a result. And you can see it has different kinds of visualizations. You can pick a map, um, subject facets, and search. And it's not um, new uh, tools. It's built out of existing tools. So why does this matter? It's because it's useful for the people we work with often to um, use this to create their data. They ingest it, augment it. They can design their own views. They can publish and embed it. And then they can share that data. So this shows how you can do that in the uh, product. You can ch pick your own views. And you end up with something like this. One of the other things we try to have people focus on is saying, you know what, it's not just about the metadata records, but pointing to the data behind it to try to get uh, users interested and know that there's data behind it. And one of the reasons we care about that is because everyone knows that preservation is not going to happen without either current access or the promise of future access. And unless you know uh, what's in there, and what, unless you can tell your users what's in there, the data is not going to get preserved, and it's going to uh, eventually disappear. So this is part of the goal of the project, is to try to get, encourage people who manage the content to look at the potential ways of turning their metadata records into views that might be of interest to other people so that people care about their content. So one of the things we also talk about um, is the importance of looking at the big picture. And here's you know, your sort of typical uh, uh, map with the little bubbles. And maybe this is a good way of showing this. Maybe there are too many bubbles. You can take your data. You can iterate it. You can take a subset and put it back through the process. And one of the other things that we try to encourage people to do is, uh, for example, Professor Holmes talked yesterday about statisticians who spend a lot of time fixing their data. Um, here, we actually try to encourage people to fix the data, to try to make it better. Um, here's an example of something that shows when the count, count of the facets shows up. You know, one of them is misspelled. Tennessee is a hard word to spell, um, so it's not surprising. And we try to encourage people to fix their metadata and therefore th fix the you know, access to their data. So what we ask people to do is to look at the views and to try to also think about it as linked data. And not only to do that, but also share the data with other people. And this shows that you can, in fact, export some of the data from this uh, tool. So what's next? Um, we are going to have an open source release of this uh, tool. Um, and you can make it so it's both public views and private day views within your community. We're going to be uh, launching it as viewshare.org. And we're hoping eventually to make bigger data sets available in the tool and using it as a portal and a remix across data sets. So um, we now offer accounts on this uh, system. And uh, please uh, explore joining the alliance with us. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.